Kallis Bervisas, the Kallis Elisete, one Swabia and New. Good evening and welcome. I'm Jonathan Thomas, the Assistant Director, and it's my pleasure to introduce my speaker, Dr. Ian Beck. Ian is a long time member, supporter, and board member of the Canadian Institute, and for 20 years was the editor of the Institute's biannual bulletin. He's participated in excavations at Morgantina in Sicily, Corinth, Comos, Hania, and at Tertunis in Egypt. Ian travelled around Greece as a member of the American School of Classical Studies in much the same way that Gilbert Bagnani had done half a century earlier at the Italian School. As the Bagnani Research Fellow at Trent University, he's been working on the Gilbert and Stuart Bagnani archives for two decades, and last spoke at the Canadian Institute about the Bagnani project in 2003. So there should be some progress. <laughs> Specifically for his book, Lost Worlds of Ancient and Modern Greece, Ian retraced Gilbert's footsteps around Greece, the Aegean, Turkey and Libya, and initiated a survey through the Canadian Institute on the island of Carpathos. Two more volumes are anticipated on the Banyani's early lives in Europe and in Egypt, where they conducted excavations at Teptunis. But this evening, the Odyssey meets Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate your introduction. I want to thank Jonathan and, and the Canadian Institute for hosting me and for facilitating the research of many years ago from the past. They've always been very supportive and I really appreciate it. An only child, Gilbert Bagnani was born in Rome, the 26th of April, 1900. His father, Lou Bagnani, was born in 1863 in Pisa, son of Giuseppe Bagnani, a pharmacist, and of Emilia Franceschetti, a nurse. Lugo's father died in 1864, when Lugo was barely one. Lugo eventually became a second lieutenant in infantry by the age of 18, attending military school and entered the elite persevere. Lugo rose very rapidly through its ranks, thanks to his recognized capabilities. Gilbert's mother, Florence Ruby Dewar, was the, was the only surviving child of a medical doctor at Port Hope, Ontario, Canada. After his premature death, when Florence was only four years old, her widowed mother took her to Scotland to be raised and educated among her relatives there, and the rich uncle left her all his property in Canada. So by a coincidence, Gilbert's parents had both been raised by their widowed mothers and never really knew their fathers. Also, Gilbert had ancestors on both sides practicing medicine. It is not known where, when, or how his Canadian mother and Italian father met. Florence Ruby Dewar married Captain Duda Vignani in September 1897 in the chapel of Trinity College School at Port Hope, Ontario. From 1908 until 1911, they lived in London, where his father was the first appointed Italian military attaché to Great Britain. There, Gilbert was raised in a diplomatic environment, while at the same time inheriting his father's military disdain for diplomats in general. In the spring of 1915, just before Italy entered the First World War against Austria, Gilbert took part in violent student demonstrations against Austria. Gilbert's father was serving as an Italian observer at the British front in France when he died suddenly in the morning in February 1917. Gilbert began studying classical archaeology at the University of Rome in November 1917, but had to attend the military, Royal Military Academy in Turin for six months, from September 1918 until March 1919, just as the First World War was ended. Gilbert's connections in Rome were with archaeological and diplomatic establishments. His mentors were not only Thomas Ashby, the director of the British School at Rome, and Mrs. Eugenie Sutter Strong, the assistant director, but also Federico Halver, the eminent Greek and Italian classical archaeologist, and Roberto Parabini, arguably the most politically influential Italian archaeologist of his generation. He was in charge of Italian archaeological missions in Asia Minor and the Levant, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Always fearless, in June 1921, Gilbert traveled alone on a potentially dangerous tour of eastern Libya, where the local Libyan tribes were resisting the Italian invasion inland. Gilbert visited the Italian excavations of the ancient Greek city of Cyrene, where many sculptures had been unearthed, like this one of the three Graces. They were the topic of one of the university papers, and of an article he subsequently published the Journal of Holy Studies. It was a politically sensitive piece, place, and time. The East, just before and after World War I, was more than legendary sites. It was a battlefield for a vicious European archaeologist. 
Even academics who knew it were looking for opportunities at the expense of a disintegrating Ottoman Empire. Early in 1921, Parabeni succeeded to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in financing several missions abroad. Parabeni had sent to Anatolia, among others, Carlo Antti, then 32 years old, and an inspector of the Prehistoric Museum in Rome. Antti's overt mission was to explore the southwestern Anatolia for potential sites to excavate, and he did discover evidence for two ancient cities in the Netherlands of Mission, west of Anatolia. When Gilbert Bagnani first sailed to Piraeus in December 1921, it was Carlo Antti who came down to meet him and bring him to Athens. In Athens, the Italian School of Archaeology occupied the Villa Macriani, an elegant white townhouse distinguished by an old porch in its north, on the corner of Sigru and the Inicial Eric Makedo Avenues. Gilbert chose a large room on the ground floor to be able to come and go while avoiding the director's rooms. The school was located between the Acropolis and the Lepierre. The next day, Andy, who had lived at the Italian school in 1913-14, studying Greek sculpture, showed Gilbert around Athens. I had a great time with Andy, who was awfully nice to me. Gilbert, who was raised by legally speaking English and Italian respectively to his mother and father, was a gifted linguist and soon speaking modern Greek. As is well known, World War I had bitterly divided Greece. Prime Minister Venizelos, as clever as a distance of Troy, was keen to join the Allies, Britain, France, and Tsarist Russia, for any potential opportunities in the disintegrating Ottoman Empire. King Constantine, however, stubborn as Achilles, was just as happened, and he wanted Greece to stay neutral, caught between the German army by land and the British Navy by sea. The Allies intervened and forcibly occupied Athens, exiling the king. Finally, Greece joined the Allies and participated in victory. By December 1921, however, Venizelos, like Churchill, had lost the post-war election. The Greek royalists were celebrating the first anniversary of King Constantine's return from exile. The streets of Antebellum Athens were festooned with lights. But as an outsider and non-partisan observer, Gilbert met with the royalist families as well as with the leading politicians of the opposing Venizelos party. To an extent, the two factions even spoke addressed differently. Through his connections in Rome, Gilbert arrived in Athens with letters of introduction to members of high society. The response to a card he had left, Maria Cleopatra Scusides, a member of one of the most interrelated old royalist families in Athens, invited Gilbert to tea. Since she had married Don Guido Cecchi Bellignani, the Prince of the Vicovara in Rome in 1915, Gilbert described her as the Vicovara who was charming and delightful to look at. Within a month, Madame Serpieri invited Gilbert to a gala party for King Constantine at their mansion. One of the richest families in Greece was actually Italian. Renetta Serpieri's father, Giuseppe Giovanni Battista Serpieri, is an engineer from Rimini who had reopened this ancient silver, silver mines at La Rea on the coast of Attica. Their neoclassical mansion is still standing at the heart of downtown Athens amid taller and more modern buildings, preserved because of the lavishness of its interior decoration. At the reception, Gilbert met the imperious Greek born Lady Law. He decided that the two most imposing ruins of Athens were the Acropolis and Lady Law. By coincidence, the side street by the mansion was named after her husband, the international economist, Sir Edward Law. Gilbert frequently met, as well, the directors and assistant directors of the American British schools. The American school is a smaller reproduction of the Roman Academy one. Marble staircase and piano we can play. There are ways up occurs. Gilbert went down to the press to greet his fellow student, Dora Levy, who would decide who would, who would decades later become the most famous Italian archaeologist in Greece. Together, they would later both greet the school's director, Alessandro de la Seda, on his arrival. On learning of Gilbert socializing, Felicity warned him not to waste too much time with the Vita Vandana, and assigned him, in addition to preparing a public lecture on the woman in front of Athens, as seen here, he destroyed sculpted freezer on the statue of Nemesis around Moose, a much more challenging topic. Incidentally, in their letters, Gilbert and his mother often used bilingual coded abbreviations to refer to individuals. In the Lasita's case, he was the W, short for silk worm or Seda. At this time, Greece was fighting a war with the Turks far away in the middle of Anatolia. The Prime Minister of Venice had a surge in May 1919. Greece had been asked by the victorious allies, Lord George, Clemenceau, and Wilson, to occupy Smyrna, the largest exporting city in the Ottoman Empire. The Greeks later expanded this campaign into all of northwestern Anatolia. Turkish General Kemal soon roused thousands of Turks to defend their homeland. The war became a protracted stalemate, with the Greek forces stranded and stretched out in the central Anatolian plateau as precariously as if Napoleon's campaign had been in Russia. 
Despite the change of government in Greece and the return of the king in December 1920, the royalist politicians too were also not able to extract themselves from this financially unsustainable situation. Since the former allies refused any aid, the Greeks were acting for the allies who then accept for Britain abandonment. What had fundamentally changed the Allies' political and financial support for Greece was oil. The First World War had revealed the military and political significance of oil. Trucks could outmaneuver trains, while oil-driven ships could be smaller and therefore faster than coal-fire-driven ships. The imperial race was on to find oil, which was suspected to be in the form of the Ottoman Mesopotamia, Syria, and Iraq. At the San Rego Conference in April 1920, the French obtained the defeated Germans 25% interest in the Turkish Petroleum Company. Greece had no prospects of oil. The Italian school government, Dr. Vincenzo Faro, was more than a more analyst and internationally recognized librarian. As a secret agent, Lieutenant Colonel Faro had raised the supply of Italian arms, ammunition, oil, vehicles, and radio transmitters, smuggled past the Greek naval blockade to the Turks. At a dinner, Gilbert also spoke with the notorious arms merchant, Sir Basil Zahara, who controlled Vickers armaments in the UK and Monte Carlo, was rumored to have financed the Greek army in Anatolia. This photo was taken when he was knighted in 1924. It was a dangerous time for unspoken journalists and writers in Athens, when Andreas Kavafakis, the editor of the Venezuela Stelethra's Tipos, was shot and killed. Gilbert believed that the loyalists at the Stratoi were responsible. When Britain and France forced King Constantine to demobilize the Greek army in June 1916, the former soldiers regrouped as reservists at the Stratoi. As a politicized militia, they were conservative, paramilitary opponents of the Venezuelans who fought to defend Athens when it was bombarded and invaded by the Allies in November and December 1916. They continued to pers persecute Venezuelans violently even after, the king, even after King Constantine returned from exile in December 1920. Gilbert recalled the previous murder of the anti venezuelan writer, Ion Gumis, as revenge for a failed uh, assassination attempt of Venezuelans in Paris. While excavating the Caramite, his Greek workers discovered a large marble block on the wall of Themistocles that was carved in low relief on three of its sides, and traces of colored print paint were still visible. They depict a wrestling match, a ball game, and a contest between a cat and a dog. The carving technique of portraying death by foreshortening the bodies dated the carving to about 500 BCE, and was much admired by everyone who went to see it, including the king, as well as Gilbert and his friends. Gilbert sent an article about it to the Morning Post in London. While well, excavating on the, on the south slope of the Acropolis, the Italians discovered the first evidence for Neolithic occupation in Attica. Consisting of work of city and plate, knives, and their army, Gilbert couldn't sell them much enthusiasm for the excavation. Brilliant and highly educated, he needed more than archaeology to, to occupy his time and mind. It soon took on a secret identity. He wrote anonymous articles as a foreign correspondent for the Morning Post newspaper in London, a first about archaeological discoveries, but soon about the Greek political scene. The sources were the families of the royalist politicians, who Gilbert noted were all interrelated, as well as the out of office and well as politicians and generals. For this reason, he made an effort to meet the British, French, and Italian ambassadors. While increasingly sympathetic personally to the royalists in Athens, Gilbert consistently adopted an artifact nonpartisan stance in his articles for the Morning Post, despite its being a conservative newspaper in British politics. In their desperation to raise funds to support the Greek armies in Central Anatolia, the finance minister, Protopapadakis, proposed novel legislation requiring that all paper banknotes be turned into the government to be literally cut in half, with the cross side being returned to the citizens, but the crown side surrendered to the government in exchange for a bond yielding 6%, thus a forced loan from the people. Since the Allies refused to lend any money to Greece as long as Constantine was on the throne, this bold and ingenious scheme was necessary to pay for the military costs, which were beyond the government's taxation powers. The Greek citizens accepted the measure stoically, as Gilbert observed. Gilbert guided rich friends on excursions to Eleusis, Delphi, Corinth, and Mycenae. Here, some large rocks had recently fallen into the Marmaria Sanctuary of Delphi. In Athens, Gilbert both attended public lectures on Greek archaeology and gave a talk about the Roman Agorot. Students began their excursions around the Peloponnese by donkey, carriage, rowboat, train, automobile, or railroad, but most of all on foot. Gilbert was fascinated by Mistra, which had been both the capital of Byzantine Greece and an abandoned outpost after the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Before its own capture, Mistra flourished as a transmitter of Byzantine culture to the West, 
a recipient of the Italian Renaissance artistic influences in the East. Most notably, was the home of Dionysus Plato, the heretical philosopher introduced Florentine humanists to Plato. Some of Gilbert's photos illustrate monuments to no longer extent. This is the church of Theodora Verga, where the Campanile has since been demolished. The local inhabitants attributed its disappearance to the Germans during the war, but in actuality, it was the Greek Byzantinist archaeologist Orlandos who removed it to purify the church for those later accretions. No, of course, such an addition because it was part of the architectural history integral to the monument. The old church at Screepland near ancient Archaeologists had lost its roof during a recent earthquake. In the Dodecanese, the Crusader castles captivated Gilbert as evidence of Western culture in the East. After, seating the, after seizing the Dodecanese from the Turks in 1912, the Italians decided to restore the extensive castle walls and the palace of the Grand Masters on roads. Gilbert was enthralled by the well-preserved fortification walls, building the streets of the old town of the Lace Hospitaller of St. John on roads, almost entirely Western in character. Gilbert met Count Alessandro de Vestari with Colin Gilbert, who had known the Vignanis in London. He took Gilbert sailing on his torpedo around the Dodecanese. When Gilbert sailed on the island of coast, it was the interwar world of the Dodecanese under Italian control. <laughs> While well, Levy and Delacena excluded a Neolithic cave of Aspipetra, Levy and Delacena were in the circle, but they didn't know the correct square. Gilbert visited the Crusader castle of Antony Black and the Byzantine fortress of Pelia Pelia, a war expert in Roman theater. On the famous sanctuary of his peak days, Gilbert could see the Anatolian coast. In the capital, of course, he encountered the captain of the Versailles Army, a very he fought with a violent temper, whom he called the King of Poets. <laughs> On July 12, 1942, Gilbert sailed to Smyrna to visit Ernesto Bradley, the brother of his mother's maid, who was very comfortably established with his family, Cardelio, a suburb just across the bay from the two mile long one from Smyrna. At that time, the commercial port of Smyrna had a population of about 400,000 souls, while Athens, the capital of Greece, had only about 250,000. Back in Italy, Greece, near Versailles and Thessaly, the Italian students excavated many statuettes of the Cave of the Nymphs, where Gilbert took the official excavation photographs and later developed them himself in Athens. I've been passing nearly all my time in the dark developing photographs. <laughs> So 12 dozen of them, which I took during my travels, and what is infinitely worse printing them. All the figures in the right hand are turned black in consequence of the acids that I have to use, and therefore I have to go everywhere with the glove in my hand. The students risked their lives ascending joint ladders up to the Cliffhagate Monasteries of the Tierra. In August, the students sailed to a swelter in the hot creek to visit Gnosis, the vast and known palace owned and excavated by Sir Arthur Evans. Too much Evans and too little bias was Gilbert's conclusion. Evans had just experienced his first earthquake, he discovered an underground room with both skulls, above a hollow space he dreamed might once have been the Minotaur's lair, among much else. Evans had found a few thousand clay tablets inscribed to what he termed the Near Beast script. We now know this was evidence for a Greek speaking administration analysis before it was destroyed about 1400 BCE. On the south side of the island, the Italians had been excavating the Manon Palace of Festox, which resembled the plan of Nelson, and Gordon, which particularly interested the Italians because it had once been the capital of Roman Crete. With temperatures approaching 50, Gilbert's ordeal by fire left him both sick and homesick. The same day that Gilbert sailed away from Athens back to Italy on Friday the 8th of September, back to 32, the Greek High Commissioner ran in Smyrna, both men leaving to have worlds about to end the violent way. Well organized and internationally supplied, Kemmel launched a surprise attack on the demoralized Greek armies, whose retreat quickly became a disorganized rope. Hundreds of thousands of panicking Greek Christians fled from the countryside in Smyrna, just ahead of the Turkish troops. On Wednesday, September the 13th, the Armenian Greek sections of the once prosperous city were put to the torch. Countless thousands of refugees were trapped along the harbor front between the inferno and the sea. They waited in vain for hours to be rescued by the international ships sitting idle out of the harbor because they had been ordered by their governments to rescue only their own nationals 
protect their own business interests like the standard oil and gas works. Indeed, they were ordered not to intervene, so as not to offend Kamal while their governments were negotiating for Turkish oil. Eventually, at 3 a.m. the next day, British Admiral Brock disobeyed orders and started the rescue operations. Eventually, there were perhaps 400,000 citizens. Almost 200,000 were transported to mainland Greece, all adult males having been taken as prisoners of war. Remnants of the Robert Greek army reassembled on the islands and set sail across the Aegean for Athens, bound for revenge on their own leaders. What was left of the Greek army staged a coup back in Athens, exiling King Constantine and arresting royalist politicians and officers. Gilbert was asked to write more newspaper articles. Within weeks of this calamity, four governments changed abruptly. In addition to the Greek coup, British Prime Minister Lloyd George was government was overthrown. The Ottoman Sultan that was abolished, and his leaders seized power in Italy. In Athens, after a military show trial, six of the imprisoned politicians were hastily executed, despite British objections, while two officers were sentenced to life in prison. The government and some of the executed politicians. This is in the old parliament building. The incarcerated Prince Andrew, brother of exile Constantine, was put on trial for military disobedience back in 1921 and sentenced merely to exile under political pressure from a British secret agent. He sailed away from Athens with his wife, Princess Alice, picking up their four daughters and newly born Prince Philip, much later Duke of Edinburgh, from the island of Corfu. In November, when the astonishing news of the discovery of an attack to the Egyptian shore made the headlines in newspapers around the world, Gilbert was able to follow it with special interest because he knew Harry Burton, the official of the Truth and Common Excavation Photographer, who lived with his wife Minnie at Florence, Italy. In a letter dated February 1923, while mentioning Egypt, Gilbert wrote, How dreadful Allen's murder, with no other reference. After several years of sleuthing, I finally identified this as Travers Allen, the grandson of Sir Hugh Allen, one of the richest men in Canada. He had traveled to Egypt to witness the excavation of Tusk II with his cousin James Allen, a friend of Gilbert's who lived in Rome. One evening during his nightly stroll, he was robbed and murdered on the outskirts of Luxor. In striking contrast to Gilbert's first arrival in Antebello, Athens, the Athens that he sailed back to in January 1923 for a second year was cold and grim, with tens of thousands of refugees everywhere, mostly women and children, of course, living in closed schools, churches, and theaters. An agreement between Greece and Turkey and a compulsory so-called exchange of populations would later increase the misery. The second flood of refugees occupied whatever spaces were available between Athens and Paris, living in tents and ramshackle shanties. A uh, military hunter was in control of his Greece, censoring newspapers, intercepting telegrams and wireless messages, and seizing letters. Gilbert resumed writing political articles, enclosing them in his letters to his mother in Rome. King Constantine died in exile at Palermo, but news of his funeral in Naples was banned in Greece. Gilbert and Paul Levy had both had their first visa renewed for a second year, joined the new students traveling around Greece, including three female students that Gilbert seldom mentions. A new Greek friend and a bitter admirer of King Constantine, Anna Cosadina, was suspected of a still unidentified political crime, and after warning Gilbert that she was in serious trouble, he destroyed his letters from her. In April, Gilbert traveled around the Peloponnese with his mother and a Canadian friend, Bristol Blake, who wrote his own diary and letters about traveling with Gilbert. He visited Roman Corinth as well as the Bronze Age sites of Mycenaean terms. The fire that had destroyed the Minoan Palace at Lossus on Crete about 1400 BC made several thousand clay tablets inscribed in the Near Greek, whose language we now know as Greek, written by the palace administrators. Nearly two centuries later, the Greek mainland, clay tablets, pottery, and fresco palaces of Mycenae in terms reflected the known influence on a Greek speaking culture. Thus, the survivors of the destruction of Minoan Creek were able to serve a new label over on the Greek mainland in a new society. Students sailed to the semi-independent male elite peninsula of Mount Athos, just staying in the fortified Byzantine monasteries there. Her life had not changed from Byzantine times. Gilbert visited a few of these, like Ibero, whose library is the largest collection of ancient Byzantine music in the world. He enjoyed the life there and hoped to return, but never did. The students then sailed on to the northern port city of Salonika, still being rebuilt after the disastrous fire in 1917, and now also filled with refugees. Back in Athens, accompanied by Anna Cosadino, Governor Polly visited Admiral Gudos in prison and General Sotikos under house arrest. He resumed writing his political articles. In June, Della Seda and Gilbert and Julia Jakopic, a new student, sailed to the island of Carpathos, which is Greek and Rose. 
At our council, they found two superposed early Christian facilities, each with extensively preserved mosaic floors from the Golden Age, when Carpathos flourished by supplying ships and sailors from the Byzantine Empire in the early Christian era. Carpathian sailors were skilled navigating against the prevailing winds to take grain from Alexandria to Constantinople. It was still building ships a millennium in later. Indeed, the tradition of Carpathia timber house and its foot levels might be reminiscent of ship interiors. Leaving Jukovic behind to excavate the basilicas, Villa Sega and Cover traveled mostly by mule to explore on the entire island. Later, they climbed up to the isolated mountaintop of the Jilimbos, where they found the matriarchal society still speaking a form of Greek derived from the ancient Doric dialect. At left coast on the west coast, Gilbert suggested the natural harbor of beaches, sheltered by the island of Sokostro, was the lost city of Nisros and Carpathos, mentioned by Strait. He discovered and described remains of a temple, extensive quarries, and an elaborate underground system. On the offshore island of Zorkestro, they found remains of dozens of systems and two much larger ones. Gilbert took photos, not yet located, and wrote a 10 page report on their excursion. This lay unpublished in Italian school archives where I discovered it and obtained permission to research and publish it. As a result, thanks to the Canadian Institute of Greece, I initiated and was able to conduct four seasons of survey of Cox and Zorkestro from 2008 to 2011. This is a process of being published in the annual of BSA. In brief, the two early Christian basilicas and other shoreline structures date to the 5th and 6th centuries CE. The dozens of small cisterns and huge cistern complexes inside the fortified circle wall of the Sokoso were used in the 11th and 13th centuries BC, CE, when Venice acquired Queen and Carpathos from the Byzantine Empire. After 1204, Carpathos became part of the Venetian patrol kingdom of Candia while nearby Rhodes was controlled by the Knights of St. John. The Florentine cleric, Gustavo Brondamonti, lived on Rhodes for several years, about 1420, studying Greek. He traveled around the Dodecanese and Kings, wrote a description of maps of the islands. There are many manuscripts that point out these scattered in various conditions. Here, with a modern sketch for clarity below, is a map of Brondamonti in the Bibliotheque National in Paris. Although the plain marked is Fianti Ruinas, all in modern. Rose of Fiati, once great, in this rectangle, is inscribed Peleonisro, ancient Israel, in the circle. On the later Venetian map, Fiati Ruinas, not Fiati R, is located opposite an island located labeled Sorzadori. Sorzadori is Venetian for languages. This ought to refer to Sokostro, since it is the only island off the west coast of Carpenter. Thus, there is documentary evidence supporting the suggestion that ancient Israel was located at the harbor of the cross. By July 1923, the Greeks had abandoned their great dream of returning to Byzantium by signing the Treaty of Lausanne and accepted the harsh reality of having to resettle a million destitute refugees in a small and impoverished country. Both Greece and Turkey agreed to the forced exchange of populations based not on language or ethnic self identification but on religion as the criteria. This conveniently included the Armenians, who had no country to go to. And no Christian Greeks were allowed to return to what had been their whole ancestral home for 3,000 years. Similarly, a few hundred thousand Muslim Turks were forced to abandon northern Greece, despite their pleas to remain. On July 12, Gilbert returned to the ruins of Smyrna, which Ernesto was helping to rebuild. He described the desolation of what was left of the once flourishing city. Back in Athens, Gilbert interviewed the incarcerated generals from Bigos for more recent priorities. On August 27, 1923, a border delegation of Italians was massacred near the Greek of uh, uh, Indian frontier. On retaliation, Mussolini bombarded and occupied the Greek island of Corfu. The Italian ambassador and military charge in Athens asked Gilbert to inspect the coastal railroad and political positions of the, in the Peloponnese. Gilbert undertook the spy mission, as he called it, under the guise of hiking in Arcadia with two Greek women to find the source of the sticks the legendary river at the entrance to the underworld. Actually, it is a modern term for a waterfall in Arcadia, but there are caves with small underground rivers and lakes in the region. Anti-Italian demonstrations forced the other Italian students to abandon the tour of Crete and return hastily to the Athens, where Doral Levy was injured in a car accident. As Anna Cosadina was nursing him back to health, Gilbert speculated that she was falling in love with him, and four years later, Doral Levy and Anna Cosadina would marry another 
After the board of color coup by some royalists, Greece was eventually declared a republic in 1924. Back in Rome, Gilbert translated into English the legal defense of the executed foreign minister, George Malthasi, for his widow, in order to accelerate his international reputation. In May 1924, no longer a student, Gilbert returned once again to Athens on a mission. <coughs> Gilbert sailed on to Constantinople in May 1924, the former capital of the two empires, and had been captured by Western Greeks in 1204, after which Greek scholars and manuscripts flowed from Byzantine Constantinople and Mistral into Florence and Venice, inspired the Italian Renaissance. All this Manilius created a Greek font to print and publish many Greek manuscripts in Venice, as visual evidence of the cultural transfer from east to west. Byzantine treasures like this bejeweled book cover still survive in the treasury of St. Mark's in Venice. Basically, Luke from Byzantium. Another physical manifestation of this contribution of Byzantium to the west was the distinctive Greek community in Venice which survived for centuries until 1948 when it evolved into the Hellenic Institute for Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Studies to preserve the Greek heritage. In 1924, Gilbert was officially sent on a mission to Turkey and stayed in the town embassy in Constantinople, where he finally had an opportunity to explore the remains of the capital of the Byzantine Empire. He was on an, an interformation gathering request for Italians who were still hoping to gain from any opportunity in Turkey. His visit coincided with an international conference there, about whether Britain or Turkey should possess oil rich Mosul in Iraq. Indeed, several Western countries are competing to sign contracts for oil with Kemal's Turkey. Despite warnings of the dangers, Gilbert sailed across the Black Sea in the nearly deserted Trebizond on the northeast coast of Turkey. This is the church of Isis being a famous for its Adidas smoking tree. Trebizond's most famous emigrant in Italy was the Catholic Cardinal Vasari who taught Platonism and donated his manuscripts to the Library of St. Mark's of Venice. Gilbert had traveled overland through what had been Armenia, by then merely a geographical expression, to what had been the trading city of Erzurum, still breathing after a devastating earthquake a month earlier. Finally, after pa passing the hillside monastery of Simula, which the monks had to abandon in the exchange, Gilbert crossed the Russian frontier to the seaport of Batum in Soviet Georgia, the mythical writer Jason led the Argonauts to the Golden Fleece. In 1924, however, it was an outlet for liquid coal through the oil pipeline from back home in the Caspian Sea. Gilbert wrote another article predicting the possibility of another war between Turkey and Russia, with Mussolini supporting Russia. Gilbert sailed back to Constantinople, Athens, and home, his mission in the East accomplished. He was only 24 years old. During his three years in the East, from 1921 until 1924, Gilbert Benani had a unique opportunity to travel on a voyage of discovery to the origins of Western civilization. As a fresh graduate of the University of Rome, he had arrived in Greece fully conversant with classical archaeology. But as an archaeologist in Greece, he traveled through time, seeing history repeat itself. The no analysis, violently destroyed about 1400 BC, enabled the transition, transmission of the known culture to the mainland Greeks of Mycenae. Byzantine Constantinople, after it was violently attacked and sacked in 1204 CE, transmitted its knowledge of antiquity to the West, and thus secured a European foothold for the foundations of modern Greece. In Ottoman Smyrna, violently destroyed in 1922, but whose survivors escaped, eventually to make their contribution to modern Greece, like shipping tycoon Aristotle Onassis and the archaeologist George Munoz. More broadly, Greeks in the US are among the most prosperous immigrants there, and in the global diaspora have shown that Greeks don't have to be in Greece to succeed. Of the worlds Gilbert left behind, the Athens of the 1920s is mostly forgotten. Apart from archival papers and photographs, although some of its buildings can still be seen, the British and American archaeological schools, the Sir Pierre Mansion, and the Old Parliament, where the show trial of royalist politicians took place, are ready to take their stratigraphical sequence in Athenian history after the earliest Neolithic occupation of Athens, that's the other Gilbert, and the glories of power to the Acropolis. No longer visible, however, are the jerry-built shanties fabricated with standard oil cans which sheltered so many refugees, the final irony. It was oil which had fueled the flames and oily black smoke which destroyed Smyrna and her inhabitants. It was the desire for oil by Western governments which, pre which prevented their support of Greece and offered humanitarian aid, humanitarian aid at Smyrna at the moment when it was most needed. To appreciate the significance of oil, one is only to contemplate the result if the oil fields had belonged to Greece or Armenia instead of Turkey. Many Christian inhabitants of Smyrna were killed figuratively as well as literally by oil. Ironically, 
One of the few parts that's sort of not destroyed was the depot of the Standard Oil Company at the point, initially protected by British sailors. The remains of Cosmo Bolt in Smyrna, however, lie buried under modern Izmir, intact and silent, until some archaeologist in the distant future lays what eyes once again on the lost pearl of the East. Living in Rome, Gilbert studied topography with Thomas Ashby in the Italian countryside, translated Italian books on archaeology for Giuseppe Nudovi, and met many prominent personalities, and Mr. Arthur Strong's afternoon salons. He traveled around the sites of the Holy Roman Empire in Central Europe, on becoming engaged to Mary Augusta Stuart Houston, the last descendant of a prominent old Terrier family. Here Stuart was portrayed by Edward Hallow, the standing between Collins and Sunni. Gilbert wrote two books on the Roman campaign and its treasures, and Rome of the Papacy, just before he and Stuart married in Toronto in June 1929. In 1930, Gilbert was invited by the classical archaeologist Carlo Ranti, an old acquaintance, to join him as his Egyptological assistant, excavating at the site of the Greco Roman town of Tertullus, about three hours southwest of Cairo. With his facility for languages, Gilbert quickly learned not only to read ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and hieratic, but also to speak modern Arabic fluently. In 1931, Antony Vidani discovered a complete sanctuary with the priest's houses and workshops intact, his vestibule lined with the sculpted trees, and a massive papyri of what's belonging to the temple library, each discovery unique in Egypt. It was the find of a lifetime, and if they'd ever published it, their name would have been as well known to Egyptologists as Howard Carter's, who discovered the two up to the column. Gilbert's wife Stewart joined him on the dig in 1932. Her letters to her mother are an additional treasure trove for ethnographers. She described living with the Bedouin and how their habits differed from the local fellahim. At the end of this season, Carlo Eddy was promoted to being the director of the University of Padua and left Gilbert in charge of the excavations in 1936. His archival papers have recently been rediscovered in Venice as well as in Padua. Gilbert's interest in photography led him to arrange for a series of aerial photos to be taken over the site in 1934-36. The nearly four dozen photos are a unique documentation of an excavation at that time and illustrate buildings no longer preserved. In 1935, both their minds died unexpectedly. Gilbert and Stuart later decided to escape fascist Hitler and moved to the New World. In May 1936, they sailed from Alexandria to Athens, where they spent two weeks meeting his old friends and sightseeing before setting up on a long drive through Yugoslavia toward Italy, their last excursion through Europe to the of the war. Gilbert bought a cattle farm near Port of Ontario, where his mother had been born, and built a large addition to the farmhouse for his art collection and library. Weekends at this oasis of learning called Gold Green were legendary. In 1945, the gentleman scholar was unexpectedly invited to teach in the classic department at the University of Toronto. He pursued studying the Neuronian author Petronius. After retiring from Toronto in 1965, both he and Stewart taught part time at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. Although Gilbert, did visit, although Gilbert did visit Italy while on sabbatical leave after the war, he never returned to Greece. Gilbert died in 1985 and Stuart in 1996. As they had neither siblings nor children, Gilbert left his papers and property to Trent University, and Stuart donated cartons of letters and photos from the archive to Ontario. Trent sold over and used the funds to help in Yoni Hall and South Street, New Orleans. We can be grateful that their early lives are preserved through their archives, since Gilbert seldom went back in his early days as an archaeologist in Greece, the lost world of his youth. Thank you. How did he make those connections? 
reminiscent of the uh, now long dead uh, Greek Canadian um, entrepreneur, financer, uh, man of uh, uh, much socializing, uh, Ian Borat. Oh, well, yes. Um, there might be some similarities, there's certainly some differences too. Um, Ian Borat, of course, is Greek. So there was one 
on, on a public stance, and that was a real fundamental reason behind the stance. Let's continue the discussion informally over a glass of wine and something to nibble. Thank you, Ian, once again. Thank you.